So this session, we're looking at from tax data to tax policy, steps to take. Uh, it should be very exciting. Uh, in the past few years, decades, there has been about four major developments uh, in tax systems. I think the first has been the introduction of VAT. That was a major change. And then there has been generally a gradual reduction in tax rates. I remember at one time in my country, Malawi, uh, sorry, my name is Ozona Ligomeka. <laughs> I'm from Malawi. I think I should have um, mentioned that at first. Uh, 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 at one time, uh, the corporate tax was 45, 50%. But generally, in most uh, countries, these rates have been going down. That has been the second major change in tax systems. The third one has been the um, introduction of semi-autonomous revenue authorities. And the idea was that once these revenue authority functions are separated from the ministers of, ministers of finance, they should be more effective in raising revenues. Whether that is being achieved, it's another discussion that we can have. But they are more interested in the fourth uh, uh, development that has happened in the tax system. And this is what we'll be discussing here uh, in this session. And this is the increase in automation of tax administration functions. And this relates to tax registration, tax filing, uh, tax payments, you know, and the whole, you know, automation systems. And once the tax administration functions have started to be automated, we have generated a lot of data. Data that before maybe we would wait for a survey, you know, or some experiments. Now we have generated a lot of tax administrative data. But with this lot of data that we are generating as tax administration, the question comes, how can we leverage on this opportunity that we have of having readily available data, tax data, to make impactful tax policy, to see how effective a policy is? So I have a panel of four individuals who have experience in using tax data for policy purposes from different countries, who will discuss this issue and share with us their journey of transforming this administrative data into policies, how they're using it. So allow me now to introduce the panel that will be discussing uh, 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 this issue. First, uh, from the far end, is Justin Makubu. Johnston is Chief Revenue Officer in South Africa. Generally, he's responsible for ensuring tax compliance. And I'm sure to know who is complying, who is not complying, he has to use data. So we should hear more from that South African perspective in terms of that. Then next to him is Tina, Tina Kaidu. Tina is a manager of research and revenue modeling in the Uganda Revenue Authority. Uh, she is responsible for overall coordination and supervision of the research lab activities. So you can't have research lab without using data. We should uh, hear more what Uganda is doing, transforming this data into policies. And then next to her is Josefa Tamami. Josefa is chief economist and she's with the a Tanzania Revenue Authority uh, in the planning section. Last but not least is um, Ayanda. Ayanda, now I have to pronounce this uh, carefully. That's why. I, I, I hope I've, <laughs> I've, tried, I've tried right. <laughs> Ayanda is from South Africa. Uh, she's director of secondary sectors at the National Treasury of South Africa. Uh, uh, and she's uh, mainly focused on the microeconomic policy unit in the economic policy division. 
Her focus is mainly on industrial policy, manufacturing, and trade. So thank you, colleagues, for being uh, here. And uh, I think without uh, much talk from me, we should uh, hear from this panel. And I have a few questions that I'll be asking the, the, the panel. Uh, so the first question I want to ask is, uh, 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 what, has been, uh, uh, what is the importance of using data for tax policy? Uh, what has been your experience and what is the importance of using tax data uh, to do policy? Okay. So I think um, the perspective that I bring, right, uh, is through the National Treasury and the Economic Policy Division. Um, and so we work with a lot of economic policy, uh, policy making, evaluating policies, assessing um, whether certain programs are working or not. And so essentially what we've tried to do in the National Treasury, partnering with SARS and UNU wider is have a program that's called the SA Tide program, which essentially um, advocates for more use of tax administrative data um, for, for evidence-based policy making and public policy evaluation. So in essence, um, you know, this, is, this was put together to try and unlock the potential for tax policy data beyond just assessing tax policy because we've had studies that look at the employer, um, employee, employment tax incentive and other tax incentives, but also beyond that and, and pushing the envelope a bit further, um, you know, in terms of research, we've also looked at various themes. Um, including um, firm behavior, productivity, um, innovation, and concentration in terms of firm productivity, for example, if I can just give you a, a sense of some of the papers that have come out of that, those work streams. Um, we've looked at you know, how misallocation of labor and capital has affected tax, um, total factor productivity, you know, keeping it, keeping it below its optimal levels. We've also had papers that have explored whether their productivity spillovers when workers move between firms, and this is enabled by the tax data, because you, know, you have a data set where you can match um, firms and their workers. Uh, I think that's one of the unique aspects that the tax data allows for us. Um, and as well as innovation, in terms of uh, innovation, we found that even though South Africa is not necessarily um, as, as, as intensive in terms of um, innovation investments, we still see quite a jump um, in terms of the returns to innovation um, through the data, and that's through the R&D tax incentive. Um, we also look, you know, we can also analyze, you know, because the tax data is structured with the uh, the personal income tax data, you have the corporate income tax data, you have the value added tax data, but you also have the customs data. So when we are able to merge all of these components together, we're then able to look at trading outcomes for firms. So we've been able to look at international trade, multinational corporations, as well as export performance of firms in South Africa, which I think you know is the most granular we've had in uh, for some time. So we've had, we've learned a lot about the types of firms that operate in the South African market, what they look like. You know, we've learned things like, um, you know, most of the firms that export in South Africa are, are simultaneously importers, you know, and that's data that we didn't have before this. We've also been able to look at, you know, whether firms in South Africa actually respond to exchange rate fluctuations in the way that we'd expect them to. And we found that actually they don't, you know. Um, it's different. It differs by destination. It it differs by product, it differs by firm size. Um, and we've also been able to look at temporary employment services, um, you know, finding that, you know, the, the impact, the penalty from wages through temporary employment is actually a lot higher in South Africa compared to what the literature would say. Um, I think I'd be wrong to not mention um, the wage and income dynamics um, literature that we've also produced, because this is one of the most comprehensive sources of income or wage data that we have in South Africa currently, which covers, you know, um, a broad scope of the of, of the wage distribution, including especially the high end, which has sometimes not been captured in surveys um, comprehensively. So this has basically allowed us to rigorously um, and at a granular level look at worker and firm outcomes in South Africa, um, as well as being able to credibly analyze wage and income dynamics. Yeah. 
I think I'll stop there. No, thank you very much for that. Uh, uh, Josepha, we are already hearing, you know, how tax data is being used to understand uh, various factors in the economy. But I want, uh, from your perspective, to know uh, why is it important to make tax data available? What do we have noted uh, for most uh, uh, countries, tax data is the uh, sensitive data, is data that maybe is not being shared with the researchers and other institutions. It is only available to, uh, to the tax administration. Why do you think it's important to start sharing this data? Uh, and how best can we do that uh, from your experience and, you know? Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, first of all, um, why data is not being shared to, to other institutions or to other parts. It's because of the sensitivity of the data, of the taxpayers' data, the, the information which are in, the, in, in, in taxpayers' data are so sensitive. So uh, to share the data, you may lose or you may, you, you may, you may, you, you may, uh, uh, in, in, you may expose the, the, the data to other people, which is not necessary. But uh, the, the tax data are very, very important to, to inform the tax makers. Uh, that's when you can share through the Minister of Finance because they need to, to make some uh, uh, policy changes when the need arise. Uh, that's when you can, you can share. But to other institutions, it's so restrictive because we just want to, to to, to, to maintain to maintain the the the, uh, the tax taxpayers information I think this is uh, uh, cut across all the revenue institutions that we have a law which uh, uh, restrict uh, to share the information unless it's shared through the the, the, the revenue authorities uh, uh, I want to add that uh, um, Tax data is very important, especially to tax, uh, tax polls people, because I, if I take my, my example of my country and I work with the Minister of Finance, you cannot change any, any policy without any, any data. So when you want to change a po any policy in our country, let's say we want to increase some uh, revenue rate, you should have. Uh, you, you, should, you should ask data from the the tax administration people, so that the government is informed that I am moving from this rate to this rate. What will be the impact of increasing this rate? Let's say I want to increase the rate of VAT rate from 20 to 22, or from 16 to 18. So that one, you have to, to get it from uh, tax administration so that you make a, a, you, you make a, a, a suitable uh, police, uh, policy, uh, policy change. Uh, otherwise, also, if we want, the government want to increase the salary to their people. This number has to come from the tax administration people in order to do how much or what rate should the government want to increase uh, uh, and what, the impact, what is the impact will, will, will be going to, ha to happen. Uh, secondly, um, um, if also the, the, the government want to do uh, uh, to reduce. Sometimes you, you, you can you can uh, attract some uh, people uh, production to to agriculture. So we want to, to reduce some taxes, maybe import to attract the people to import some uh, to, some raw materials. You should have a data to know how much the government is going to give or is going to lose in terms of in terms of tax because you are collecting this amount and I want to to reduce some amount so that the, I, I attract. Uh, uh, production or I attract a production from agriculture sector, you have to know how, the, you have to have the data so that you, 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 you do your, 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 poly, your policy change. So it's very important, the data is very crucial in our development, in our any, any activity or any policy we want to undertake in, in, in the country. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I'm still sensing that, yes, this, this, this data, tax data, is still confidential. So it's either you get it through the, uh, the, the, the Revenue Authority or the Ministry of Finance. Uh, this is where we're sharing it. But I want to hear from Uganda, uh, uh, Tina. I know that you've partnered with some of the research institutions, the ICTD, to do a lot of research in Uganda. How are you able to share this uh, uh, 
tax data with these institutions that are even not a Ugandan institution? And uh, why did you see that this is important? Maybe you could share the Uganda experience and how you're doing it. Um, thank you. Uh, from Uganda's perspective, it's been quite a long journey for us, a journey of collaboration with different um, research agencies. And over time, we realized that we needed to structure this process of um, availing data for research purposes. Um, as you rightly put in your introduction, that uh, we've automated, revenue administrations have automated, and Uganda inclusive, and we've generated a lot of data. However, this data uh, has to be put in a structured format for it to inform policy. Uh, revenue authorities primarily collect data for, for government um, for, to meet, uh, to, to, to exercise our mandates. However, this data can also be used to inform research, to inform policy and administrative um, re uh, reforms. So when we realized that um, we had this resource and we didn't uh, have the capacity, we had to partner with other agencies, ICTD, UN, UIDA. But again, in order to manage this in a structured way, we had to work through memorandums of understandings, non-disclosure agreements, and this took quite a lengthy process for us to actually formalize the arrangement and all that. So over time, through sharing with our partners, we were able to come up with a research data lab uh, that is um, stationed at the URA. So in this lab, we collect the data, we anonymize it, we document it, and make it available for researchers. Uh, we work on mutually agreed uh, research areas, or sometimes we actually um, are informed of some areas that are cri critical for domestic resource uh, mobilization. So we work hand in hand and make this data available. Um, through our, those are the MOUs, we also are able to be part and co-author papers with um, international researchers, which has been a plus for us as well. So when research is conducted and insights are, um, are drawn out of this, we've been sharing across the board with policymakers, with tax administration, and this has uh, helped us improve, uh, improve our policymaking process. So to us, this has been a win on our side because um, we generate detailed data from uh, the formal sector that uh, is paid through uh, our systems, and the frequency of this data is usually on, my, on, on um, a regular basis, as opposed to surveys, which are done periodically. So we believe a lot of insights uh, to improve our policy process are being drawn as a result. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. No, thank you very much uh, for that. Yes, uh, so how are you overcoming the issue of the confidentiality of data? And as we've heard from uh, Uganda, you know, you can have an MOU and maybe the data can be shared uh, anonymized. And that, as you're saying, it's proved to be uh, quite useful to have robust results because you're collaborating with institutions from uh, uh, other countries and even research institutions that can share knowledge and skills. So, uh, very exciting. Um, how about South Africa? Uh, Johnson, maybe we can hear from you. Uh, uh, why do you think it's important to be sharing the tax data and how do you go about it? Are you collaborating with other institutions? And how do you share this data and what is important? Sure, I think um, without repeating what the colleagues have said, um, looking inward to the tax administration becomes very important to have a data governance framework. Because I think um, without a data governance framework that governs who has got what authority over what data, um, it becomes quite blurry in terms of uh, what governs the data within the tax administration. So 
as a South African revenue service, we found it quite fitting that we define the, the data governance framework within the organization, uh, which defines who is the data governor for what part of the data within, within the tax administration, and therefore that person owns the data end to end, uh, including uh, pronouncing what um, uh, happens in as far as sharing of the data is concerned. Uh, we, quite uh, some time back, uh, almost a decade ago, um, uh, had collaborated with Uniwide and the National Treasury, and as said, uh, to create a data lab, because we felt that um, whilst there's many problems that need to be defined um, that lead to policy formulation, those problems are crystallized better in the data. So we, um, we push through uh, almost monthly uh, to the data lab at National Treasury, uh, real, almost real-time uh, taxpayer data. And I think uh, without a database or a data lab, it would become very difficult to be able to um, share uh, data, of course. Um, things such as confidentiality is, is quite uh, sacrosanct to us. And that's why we, we, we anonymize mask data. We are very careful um, uh, that we don't inadvertently uh, expose taxpayer information, especially where you've got very limited number of taxpayers in a particular geography and you are doing uh, geographical analysis, analysis uh, as a researcher. We want to make sure that we don't eat inadvertently um, expose confidential taxpayer information. So we do mask, we set thresholds uh, in terms of what's a minimum we should be able to uh, expose in the data so that we avoid uh, uh, inadvertently putting out uh, data in the environment. But I think um, it's actually a, a, a virtuous cycle. Um, the more we share information uh, with researchers, the more we are able to, amongst other things, uh, have policies, uh, policy decisions that can be conceptualized that help, amongst other things, with domestic resource mobilization so that we are able to uh, continually uh, feed into the revenue uh, cycle in terms of collection of revenues. So I think there's a symbiotic relationship that exists between us responsibly sharing the data through the data lab, us interfacing with the research environment in the academic space, especially through uh, UNIWIDER, but also other academic institutions uh, that are out there. And maybe lastly, um, what made it comfortable for us to want to approach the issue of the data lab is that almost 14 years ago, we started publishing tech statistics um, for the country. Um, and that information in the public domain is very rich for researchers but even more better if that information can be puzzled at a very granular level. Because again, even if you do uh, publish text statistics, sometimes they're at a very aggregated level and you need it at a, at a disaggregated level. Mm -hmm. I, I think I'll stop there for now. Yeah. No, thank you very much. I think what is coming out clear uh, uh, from the, the, the panel is that you know, it's important to be sharing this data and uh, what you can do with this data I under what you, you, you were talking about. But I think uh, two important things that have come out. One is have to have, uh, you need to have a proper framework of how this data is going to be shared. Because at the end of the day, it's still taxpayer data, it's still confidential data. How best do you share that data? And second, it's this um, aspect of having a dedicated unit. Uh, I'm sure it's doing a whole aspects of data governance. Uh, which I think is coming out quite clear and um, uh, it's, uh, it seems very important. Uh, uh, but uh, now coming back, I, 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 I mean, uh, I want to, to, to ask you, what has been some of the challenges of using this tax administration data uh, that you've experienced? I, I, I want to, to come back to you. Uh, uh, well, um, one of the major challenges we've um, experienced uh, is the data quality. Uh, like I mentioned, this data was prime, is, uh, originally is collected for, uh, for tax, you know, mobilization. Um, but, however, we are now using it to inform 
policy. So having it um, out there, we have been um, obtaining a lot of feedback from researchers, and in a way, this has helped us improve, uh, address some of the gaps that are being seen within the data. So for us, uh, what would seem like a challenge has been an opportunity to improve uh, the quality of data. And, but also, uh, tax administration data is prone to misreporting because of the self-assessment regime that we have. Taxpayers are declaring and telling us what they would want us to see. So when we are uh, using this data to conduct research, uh, we need to be cognizant of that, so we, we try as much as possible to go through a rigorous uh, data cleaning process to structure the data in a format that is usable for researchers. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Ayanda, how about you? Uh, you're using micro, uh, you know, this data to understand micro aspects of the taxpayers. What has been some of the challenges of using the tax administration data? Okay, maybe I'll answer your question in, in two folds. So maybe I'll talk to some of the, uh, some of the challenges that we also faced as South Africa in setting up the data lab, for example, just to take a step back. Um, you know, I think data sharing in, in any case, um, as everyone has said, you know, um, you start by finding, the, you know, you have to make a legal case for why you should have the data in the first place. So I think maybe it's important to give that context that, you know, this is a long journey. Um, if you date back to where we started, I think Johnston talked about, um, it's, over, it's been over a decade, I think, since we started developing this. And so it's a work in process, you know, and every year I think we learn new challenges. We need to learn to solve new challenges. Um, capacity has been one of the greatest challenges I think we've also faced, just in terms of getting the right kind of skills and people that you can work with who have the vision that you want to lay out for the lab um, from recruiting the right kind of skills for people who are data scientists, who can clean the data, who can actually run quality checks on the data, um, who can transfer the data in a, in a manner that is secure, that doesn't compromise the data, because it's important for us to ensure the integrity of the data in the data lab. We had to put in place a lot of systems to ensure that the data that's extracted from the lab um, is of good quality and research quality, um, and that you know we, we try to limit any exposure to taxpayers. Um, as Tina had already indicated, this data wasn't intended for research. And so you know I think even I as a taxpayer, <laughs> if my information ended up in the public domain, I'd be very frustrated. So there are a lot of processes and protocols that we've had to put in place. Um, and I think even with our lab being quite developed at this stage, we still find little glitches every now and then where we see that actually we can't make certain calls on a case-by-case -case basis. It's important to have frameworks in place, policies in place that eliminate human error and so that everyone understands what procedures and processes need to be there. So to the best way possible, I think, you know, those are some of the other challenges that you face in trying to allow data accessibility um, to, to, to users and, and researchers broadly. Um, but also, I think, uh, some, you know, some, of, some of the other challenges that you, you end up facing, uh, and, and I guess I'm preempting sort of where we want to get to in the future, SARS allowing, <laughs> is um, you know, with, with taxpayer data uh, or tax administration data, not having been positioned for research, you'll find that there are elements that you'd like to pull into the tax data so that you can better understand the individuals that you're capturing and the firms that you're capturing and other characteristics that give you a fuller picture um, of the economy and who you're actually looking at um, and what else could be driving the results that you're seeing. So I think that you, know, you, you then move into a phase as well where when you're thinking of expanding and how you, you grow from where we are now, incorporating new um, data sets further risks de-identifying data, you know, the, the, the things that we have to put in place, ensuring that we're still compliant 
with the Puppy Act, which is the Protection of Personal in, um, uh, Information Act in South Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so we've had to learn that there are processes on getting exemptions from the information regulator, which we're currently undertaking, um, to try and see what's possible, what else you can add, um, un you know, unemployment insurance information, um, some procurement data as well. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I think admin data, uh, I guess I want, what I want to highlight <laughs> from this lengthy speech is that you know, I think there's so many challenges. It's such a, a long uh, process. Um, and sometimes when we talk about all of the results that we've seen and that we're able to get from the data, it doesn't really show um, just how much work and effort has gone into it by everyone who contributes to, to the project. Yeah. All right. Uh, very interesting uh, to look at all these challenges. Uh, uh, Josefa. I'm hearing a lot of data quality issues that we need to, 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 to think about, uh, even about uh, the, 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 the how do we get the right skills to analyze this data. Do you want to add anything on the challenges that you, might have, you may have faced uh, while using this tax administration data? Yeah, of course, uh, the, the issue of uh, data quality uh, is uh, very crucial because uh, uh, we are lacking some uh, some training so on how to to manage the data which we are we are, we are collecting for for taxes. As uh, as said that uh, the, the the tax data which has been collected there, we are collecting data for taxes which are not meant for research purposes. But also we need to to have some capacity building in collecting data and keeping this data which we are we are collecting so we did we need a clean data and so we need a, a, a capacity building so as to to know how are we going to to collect that and how are we going to 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 to, to, to manage the data which we, which we are collecting. That is a challenge to us also because uh, as I, I see back uh, back home that we have a, a lab and uh, we have some people who are working with the data, tax data. So those people need to be incapacitated uh, so as to, to produce a clean data when it uh, at all is needed. They uh, produce a, a, a data which can be used all, all over and the accuracy of the data which uh, is being kept by, by, by the uh, tax administration. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Thank you very much uh, for that. Uh, now I want to uh, look at another question and this is the linkage uh, from data to policy. How do we make sure now that we're using this data for tax policies that are impactful and that will be taken by the policy makers? Uh, you take this uh, information, you've analyzed the data, uh, and the minister would say, yes, I think this is a policy that uh, I should take to parliament. Take me the, through the process. How best should we be using this data to make sure that we are having policies that are being taken on board. Uh, I want to start with you, uh, Jensen. Um, look, I think, firstly, it, it starts with uh, an understanding that it's not one paper that is written that influences policy. We often get asked questions to say, but the paper as tax administrations, but we gave us information and we published the paper, and when is it becoming policy? And, um, and I found that uh, the appreciation and understanding that it's a multifaceted approach. It takes a number of papers to bring a particular um, uh, research, I mean, tax policy to, uh, to pass. So but I think it's important to make sure that as we do research, the likes of National Treasury, Tax Administration, and academic institutions are always in the loop because we don't want to wait for the process. We want to make sure that the research that is being done from when it is sanctioned, identified and sanctioned, it is meant to address uh, policy challenges that are pressing in the first fiscal environment. So we don't necessarily do uh, research uh, for the sake of doing research. We are doing research in response to some of the pressing policy challenges that we have. I think for me, it starts by making sure that the genesis of the research that we do is informed by the fiscal problems and challenges that we are trying to address as, um, as sovereign states. I think when that is achieved, 
it makes it quite, in fact, it leaves an anticipation for that output from a research perspective uh, to come through. We've been pondering in South Africa around the issue of wealth tax, and, uh, and I'm sure if you speak to uh, uh, political authority, they want to know what researchers are saying about that particular subject in as far as uh, the nuances of the South African economy are concerned. Uh, and therefore, research that is tilted towards a bending platform is research that becomes relevant in terms of addressing some of the structural issues that uh, uh, we are faced with at a political level and at a tax administration level, if I may add. So I think, uh, for me, what is important is to make sure that there is relevance in the research at its onset so that uh, there, there is a clear link uh, to what policy problem you're trying to address uh, through that type of, of research that then comes out. Uh, I think I'll stop there. Okay. Thank you very much. I think uh, I'm, I'm catching there the emphasis on robustness of these uh, findings. Uh, it's not just one paper. Uh, we've done a research uh, on VAT, and it shows that if you increase VAT from 10% to 15%, you collect more and you run with it without looking at other aspects of that policy. Uh, thank you for that. Um, you want to jump in? What are some of these steps that we should be looking at we, you know, when we are transforming from this data, we've made it available, and how do we transform it into policy? So I think to, to add to what Johnston um, has put forward, I'd say you know, I think there are many ways um, to try and, and get the research to be top of mind for policymakers. Part of that for us we've seen has been collaboration collaboration between policymakers and researchers um, have been one of the, the best ways, I think, to equip, to, to you know, in, essentially change an institution to be a lot more research-driven um, and evidence-based. So when, you know, when the, when the policymakers can almost own the research results and what has been put forward, they are a lot more comfortable to be able to infuse that into um, policy position papers, um, you know, at Treasury, I think a lot of the research that we do falls into the policy position papers that we put forward um, that help us develop, you know, a, a Treasury view on certain things. Yes, everyone does the research in their personal capacity, but when enough evidence is there, you, the department is then able to say, this is our view, um, I don't know, on the employment tax incentive and whether it's been impactful or not. Um, this is our view on the R&D incentive. This is our view on localization policies or industrial policies. Um, so I think that collaboration can't be emphasized enough. Um, and, you know, I think another aspect of things is for, you know, I think when, when you, even when I write in my academic capacity, I sometimes have to take a step back and reflect on the policy decisions that are, or policy recommendations that I want to make in a paper. I think marrying these two aspects of things more intentionally when we write academic papers is important. Even taking those papers, whether you're collaborating with policymakers or not, and presenting them to government departments, it's a very different kind of platform. It forces you to package your research results in a way that you know, almost forces you to crystallize exactly what the policy intentions are and what you expect the people that you've put in the room to, to take from your presentation. So I think that, you know, the where I've seen the most traction from research and people engaging in research is when you actually have academics coming to present um, in policy seminars. Um, I think we can't, you know, I wouldn't... Um, and to look that. Mm -hmm. So I think that all of those things show you that incrementally, um, we, we, we really do try to infuse a lot of the work, specifically with the tax related work, because you know Treasury has also invested quite a bit in it. We try to also infuse some of the research into our, uh, our budget reviews and documents when we have staff members that have produced papers, for example, and we're able to showcase that in our annual um, publications as well as Treasury. And I think that that goes a long way into infusing certain ideas that allow policymakers, you know, you might not directly see the connection, but you're slowly influencing the thinking of the people who work in those institutions, mm -hmm. and they're able to then make better decisions because you're, you're informing them and giving them more evidence to be able to make the best decision that they can mm -hmm. when they're trying to put together a proposal for a minister or for parliament or a cabinet briefing. Yeah. 
Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Justin says uh, uh, robustness of the, you know, the, our results because it's just not on paper that uh, you know, we should rely on. Uh, we should be robust. Uh, you're saying collaboration. Let's understand the policymakers. What are they looking for and how do we present it to them in a way you know, that they, they, they can consume. Uh, Josepha, again, the same question. Uh, we have made this data available. How do we make sure that we're using it well after when we're using it for policy that is impactful? Uh, take us through the process. What do you think are some of the important aspects when we have made the, the data available so that it, it's uh, used well for policy? Yeah, uh, I think the, 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 the main issue is to, to include uh, some institution in, in, in data management. Uh, and so that we don't depend on on one institution for the purpose of making policy. We have a different inst uh, research institution. We can also collaborate with them for data management so that when we, met, we take a data from the, the tax administration, we can compare with the data. Maybe the Minister of Finance also can be included in, da in, in, data, uh, in data collection so that to, uh, when you receive data from tax administration, you also compare with the data from the ministry and other uh, research institutions which are in the country so that the data which are collected from different parties can also be used and make a comparison so that we don't depend on one area. That's what I can say for that step to take. Uh, thank you very much, Tina. What do you think? Um, creating awareness of um, you, uh, to the, the very le relevant stakeholders using available channels, and uh, this could be um, dissemi conducting dissemination workshops where you engage uh, policy makers, decision makers, the civil society, and share some of these uh, results that are coming through the papers that have been developed. Could, uh, we've also done prepared policy briefs that are also shared with those um, stakeholders. And this, in a way, is creating awareness of uh, the data that has been used and the insights that have been drawn from uh, the different studies that have been undertaken. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe uh, I can add that it's, 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 it's perhaps also important for policy review because I think um, it, it, it's not only when we are formulating policy, but this data becomes very important for the purposes of decisions we've made in policy. We, we've made some decisions in South Africa around uh, some retirement reforms. And through uh, our micro simulation at PIT level through the PIDMOD, we started to see the implications or the impact of the policy decision. And I think um, another close or feedback loop that is important is the policy review feedback loop to say, what do we then do um, based on the evidence that we are seeing post implementation uh, of certain uh, policy decisions? And I think it's important that that loop also be, be leveraged fully through research because once these policy decisions are made, I found that uh, whether again it's retirement reforms or it's um, sugary beverage le levies or health promotion levies, Th these decisions need to be checked for efficacy uh, and, and research comes in quite uh, importantly, especially at the back of reliable data mm -hmm. that then feeds uh, back. I just want to raise the issue of policy decision reviews, mm -hmm. um, utilizing data uh, so that we can be in a continuous improvement mode in terms of our policy environment. Mm -hmm. Uh, thank you, and uh, I think that's important indeed that uh, once we've made the policy, we need to go back to see how that policy is operating. And uh, I think awareness is also important. So we've conducted uh, this research, we've used this data, we have these results, but so what? Uh, sometimes it's not just for policy, or even before we, we make policy, we need to make people aware of what the results are saying so that they can even support the policy. Uh, no, thank you very much for that. Um, one of the limitations of, of the tax administration data, I think some of them, you have already started, you have already raised them, uh, but also I've noted that um, for most of our countries, uh, developing countries, 
We are relying on this tax administration data, but this data is limited because most of the businesses are informal, in which case they are not registered with the revenue authority. Thus, we do not have uh, data or information about these taxpayers that are not registered. How should researchers now start thinking about the informal sector and how we can start you know, into extracting some information that we can use for policy purposes? Uh, because we have always had um, taxing the informal sector, how best to do it. Uh, so I was thinking this issue of data, we are focusing, we are taking data from the tax administration. But this tax administration doesn't have data from the informal sector. What should researchers or tax administrations be doing in order to have information from this other aspect that the tax administration might not have? Uh, Ayanda, you want to start? You know, I, I guess we can't expect the tax data to answer all questions. So having the tax data doesn't necessarily remove the need for survey-led um, research, for example. So I think that there's still ongoing efforts, um, especially by the statistics departments as well, who try to survey the informal economy. And you still have that data as well. I think you can just use it in conjunction you know, with the tax data, it won't have as much coverage because you're obviously then, you know, you're limited to the areas that you're able to sample to capture informal activity. Um, but I think that's not to negate the importance. I think you raise a really good point. Um, it, you know, it's important to, to understand that we're only looking at formally registered um, businesses and formally employed people when we're using the tax administration data, which I think has its, its benefits. But I, I would, I think I'd, I'd say that, I'd say um, revenue institutions, uh, especially I guess SARS and Johnston probably can come in on this, um, will still leverage the, the research that comes out of which parts of the informal economy can be better formalized um, and brought into the, the system as well. I think that's always an ongoing effort. Um, but I think it, uh, you know, we should always leave room to separate the two where we have formalization um, because the burden as well of forcing in the informal economy to formalize and have to report, um, it, you know, it becomes very uh, challenging for them to survive in that way, um, which is why I think we're always um, wary of increasing red tape for even small firms as well um, to some extent that are informal. Um, so I, I would say you continue running survey-led research to get insights and understand the size of the formal economy and what can be done to help them and assist them so that one day they can transition and become formal so that you can start receiving revenue from them. Um, but uh, yeah, I'd, I'd separate the two. All right. Thank you. Yeah. Maybe to just add, I think by, by and large there's an appreciation that you need to shift from structured data, return data in your methodology uh, from a tax administration point of view to also incorporate unstructured data. Uh, we've for a long um, time only uh, looked at retained data as structured form of data. And I think in uh, the days of big data and uh, machine learning, we are learning in artificial intelligence, we are learning that uh, we also need to leverage um, big data, or rather uh, unstructured data for the purposes of uh, creating visibility of the tax ecosystem, um, including the informal sector, by the way. So I think... Uh, for me, it becomes important that we don't only take a structured approach to data, but also start to incorporate unstructured data. I mean, we, in the South African Revenue Service, we've started to, to, to ask, for instance, what machine learning should we introduce that sweeps the social media to be able to, to pick up, because that's not retained data, it's unstructured data that gives you insights around what's happening. Uh, uh, if you want to argue what people are posting and what are they saying in their social conversations. This is where you have it unstructured data and you start to say, what does this data tell you, tell you about the tax ecosystem uh, and the fullness thereof? So, so I think I'm arguing for, um, yes, there's structured data element, but there's also an unstructured data that you can be able to create uh, machine learning uh, and where mach unsupervised machine learning can assist in terms of making sure that we enrich the data that we have, of course, deal with the issues of reliability of that data and how you can, you can augment it. We, we are of the view that it's the combination of both structured data and unstructured data 
that will take us to, to where we need to get to in future. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, yes, yes, uh, um, please. Interagency cooperation and uh, data sharing mm -hmm. can also go a long way in um, enriching the tax data. Uh, we've seen this when we, on a limited scale, um, obtain data from the local authorities because they have um, players in the informal sector that are not into the tax net. But of course, uh, the limitation of probably merging that data or making that data speak to each other is the lack of a unique identifier. But uh, I, I believe if data is shared across and probably these gaps are addressed, it could go a long way into making, uh, enriching that tax data. Thank you, yeah. Okay. Yeah, uh, to add on that, we can e e also uh, standardize the data to uh, and co which we are collaborating with the local government to see what type of data do we need so that they can uh, arrange the, according to your, to your, your, your requirements uh, for the informal sector. So we can tell them that we need uh, data in this format so the local government can, can, can uh, create data in the format which is uh, needed. So the standardization could help us to get data which is not a tax uh, uh, data also. Thank you. Uh, very interesting indeed. Uh, a lot of collaboration and this, uh, the use of uh, unique identifiers so that we can easily do data matching is very important and I see that uh, other countries, I think uh, Tanzania, you, you do use one number to register a bank to do, and that helps you know, in data matching. Uh, Thank you very much for all that. Um, a quick recap of what we've said uh, so far. So first, uh, on the issue of why it is important to, 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 to share tax data, uh, and I think the sentiments are that uh, once we've shared and we collaborate with others outside, there's skills uh, sharing and you know, improvement of the quality of the, the, the results that we get. Uh, but to share the tax data still remain sensitive, so we should have a proper framework and a proper data governance, uh, a proper data governance framework to help us, to enable us to actually do this in a lawful manner. Uh, I think that's what we've said. And on the issue of uh, uh, what has been some of the challenges in using uh, the, 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 the tax, tax data. I think the, what has been highlighted is one is the quality. We still need to keep working on how to improve the quality of the data, especially because it's self-reported. So we have to be mindful of that when we are using it. Um, and the issue of confidentiality, we should not forget uh, whenever we're using this data and then capacity of the people using the data. Um, if it's academia, maybe there's capacity there, but when it's the revenue authority or the Minister of Finance, maybe there's lack of capacity, and this is where maybe the collaboration comes in and uh, becomes uh, helpful. And then we have talked about the linkages with other institutions where we can obtain data, and the, uh, even data from the informal sector. Um, and lastly, how do we make the, our research uh, using the data now into policy and making it impactful? Uh, I think the issues that have been discussed here is first, uh, we make sure that the results that we are producing are robust. You produce a result here, everyone is laughing, it's like, no, that doesn't work like that. Next time you come, they'll not listen to you, say, ah, no, we can't use this research paper. So as much as possible, we make sure that you know, the research we are doing is robust. And second, I think you're saying collaborating, and I, 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 I want to agree with that. Uh, sometimes you, you, you have uh, some tax incentives, uh, and this, some of these incentives maybe are exemptions to, to the minister, uh, the president, the members of parliament, and you think it's a bad policy. But for you, from the minister of finance to say, let's remove this incentive, uh, it becomes difficult. But when you collaborate with, say, ICTD, and ICTD writes a paper to say, these are some of the incentives that are removing money, maybe it becomes you know, easier to communicate that, to say, these are, it's not us, but this research institution is saying this, and maybe this is the direction we should be taking. I think that's one of the importance of collaboration. So thank you for this. Uh, now I would like to open it up. Uh, for questions from whatever we've discussed here or any other questions related to data and how we move from data to policy. So now it's open online and uh, 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 my colleagues here. Uh, 
wonderful presentations. I'm uh, Arnold Chinfwembe from the Zambia Revenue Authority. Uh, my question is probably something that uh, was on covered, I think, in his closing remarks, and uh, Johnston covered it also, I think, on uh, policy review. It's more or less in terms of uh, two-way traffic, in terms of the way the question will come. So this has to do with uh, tax expenditure. So how do revenue authorities conduct this in order to advise tax policy? And certain policies that come from probably the policy makers to give incentives, how do revenue administrations track the impact of uh, those incentives that are given over a period? So I would also give another example of certain, for example, let's say VAT. You have certain products that have been zero rated for quite some time. Huh? How do revenue authorities track these tax expenditures over time? And given that you have all the data that you have is sitting in one place, kindly maybe give a comment on that. Thank you. Another hand there. Thank you very much. Um, my name is Ezra Madzvanika. I am uh, the research manager at African Tax Administration Forum. I am uh, impressed by the discussion regarding data because as ATAF, we also handle data for 37 tax administrations in Africa. And basically, the data that we have been uh, collecting through our member tax administrations is macro-level data. But here we are talking of micro-level data through the data labs that um, um, I hear the panelists are talking about. And so my interest and in my question to the panelists is we have been collecting uh, on behalf of the members macro-level data and we also have a vision of uh, actually collecting micro-level data. Um, one of the global, for example, the global discussions on international taxation issues, like the ones happening at the OECD level, require us to have micro-level data for us to uh, voice our concern as Africa. We need to have uh, tangible um, evidence to say this is what the data is telling us. This is the data that we have regarding the multinational companies in uh, African countries. So my question to the panelists is how can we collaborate so that we can, because for example, Tina said we can collect the data, we can go to Uganda and get the data and, and use the data lab uh, we cannot uh, transfer that data because it's, it's, it's sensitive and we cannot actually have it, um, but we can go and use it there. But I'm trying to see whether we cannot have also um, a situation whereby we can have this consolidated data like we are doing for the macro level data. Because sometimes also working with panel level data it will be actually be more robust than working with one uh, country level. So that is my my first question to to the panelists: How we can we can get that data? Secondly, I wanted to say uh, regarding what South Africa is talking about uh, wealth taxation. I think as ETAF we have already circulated an a call for expression of interest for our tax administrations who want to collaborate with us uh, on taxation of high net worth individuals. And we have already received uh, like eight expression of interest from member tax administrations. What I just wanted to say is like what the chair said, it's actually better for such sensitive uh, topics where you think maybe politicians are involved. And if you use, if you work with the uh, collaborating partners, you can be able to get actually the information that you want uh, without having many challenges. So I, this is just a, a, a comment and encouragement to say, let's do it. Uh, collaborations are necessary. And uh, ETAF is, uh, is, 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 is an MOU with Yen Wider. And so we work together. Um, last week, we actually held the ATRN, which is the African Tax Research uh, Network. 
And uh, I'm happy because Amina was representing uh, the UNWIDA at the ATRN Congress. So collaborations are important and they're encouraged. Thank you. Thank you very much for your uh, for the discussion. I found it really interesting. Um, I would first of all like to uh, acknowledge the incredible amount of work that's gone into making this data available. Uh, all of you uh, there on stage, your colleagues in country, colleagues in other countries, it's, it's a lot of work and it's been incredibly beneficial and it's not obvious at all. Uh, just 10 years ago this data wasn't available, now there are so many studies that inform policies and, um, and it is to be celebrated. But my question is very similar to what was he asked before, uh, what do tax administration need to do to have information on the informal sector, except I would ask a slightly different question, which is what do tax administration need to do to get revenue and information on high net worth individuals? And I would like to particularly ask your views on, based on the data that you help put together, that you manage, what is the potential in that data to start taxing high net worth individuals more effectively? What are the limitations? Um, and maybe following up on what Azera just said, uh, I understand this is a politically sensitive area and uh, we as independent researchers can sometimes uh, do things that are harder to do from within government and within government institutions. So what do you think is the scope there for people like uh, me as an independent researcher, but there, there are so many others, so this is not really about me. What can we do as independent researchers to support progressive reform um, and especially taxing high net worth individuals more effectively? Thank you. Yeah. Thank you very much for those questions. Uh, we can come for another round and we'll check, uh, I think, soon after this uh, if we have any questions online. So uh, who wants to take any of the questions? Who wants to start? Maybe let, me yes. maybe let me start. I think, I think we've been reporting on tax expenditures in South Africa for quite some time now in our tax statistics um, in as far as quantifying the impact of um, uh, most of the, uh, the exemptions, uh, whether it's in the um, automotive sector or whether it's in the research and development. I think we're quite comfortable that we are able through the collaboration with different institutions to capture that data and, and report it. Is it complete? I'm not yet convinced that it is as complete as it should, but I think if you look at our 14th edition that we published in December last year, you'll be able to see that uh, we go to an extent in terms of quantifying this. Uh, I think again, uh, there is work that has been done at of either the Treasury or Department of Trade and Industry to start to quantify even better the, the tax incentives or any incentive scheme uh, that is in place. So I think um, more and more uh, the quantification of these expenditures and therefore making decisions on which, which ones must be retired and which ones must be sustained uh, is work that is ongoing. But I'm encouraged that the visibility is, is there, it's available at least in the South African context. And I think it's work that must be done because um, we spoke earlier on around the bigger implications, macro implications of some of these uh, incentive schemes that are out there. Um, in South Africa and as far as taxation of high wealth individuals, um, we decided to set up, because I think we believe in the segmented approach into the tax base. We think that once you segment your tax base, you're able to have focus uh, we, we segmented that, created a, un, a, a unit that is responsible for the taxation of high wealth individuals and following the global practices that we have seen elsewhere. But I think the leveraging of data such as the CRS, there's a paper earlier on that was presented where we saw that there is um, around, in our case, uh, using 2018 data, 420 billion rands worth of offshore holdings by South Africans, and we are starting to, to, to unpack that. Uh, it's a lengthy process, uh, but we are confident that we are going the right direction in terms of that work. Also leveraging the number of leaks that uh, have come through in terms of the original one, Panama Papers. So we think the focus in segmentation, as well as uh, exchange of information, in particular CRS, 
to be able to see what uh, offshore holdings our South African citizens have is starting to give us sharper focus in terms of the high uh, wealth individuals that are in our jurisdictions. And we're starting to see some gains in terms of revenues. Um, uh, we found about 6.6 .6 billion rands worth of uh, undisclosed assets uh, in a sample that we've looked at, which has generated around 207 million in taxes. So we, we continue to find uh, momentum as we hit these uh, sweet spots in terms of revenue gains. And I think uh, we continue to want to make sure that the construction or the creation of the um, high wealth individual unit uh, does get justified by the return uh, to the fiscus in terms of revenues and uh, tax base broadening, which is the, the pursuit that we'd like to, to have. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Um, I, I, I want to add on that the tax incentive group provided or granted to, to some uh, business or institutions or, or other uh, external, external uh, institutions is a, it is an exemption. So that one is being taken care. Uh, for example, in TRA, we have a section which is dealing with tax exemption. Why do we have that? Because we have to inform the policymakers that look here, you are overdoing on uh, exemption which you are granting to to s some people. So uh, in East Africa, we are we 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 have agreed that the tax exemption should not exceed. 1% of uh, GDP. So we have to make sure that we inform the government that where are we in such uh, uh, exemption which we are granting to some business people. So we do take an, uh, an account of that. Yeah. Joseph, sorry, uh, just to, to, to ask, um, do you make this information public? Is it you know, like the minister announced it in parliament or it's uh, something that will just make uh, available to the policy makers? Is no, it public the, information, the tax yeah, expenditure? Yeah, it's not the, the case of the uh, tax administration to announce to the public. If you send to the Minister for Finance, he is the one to announce that uh, what exemption them have, uh, the country has given to, have, uh, have uh, issued. But uh, uh, some, uh, some parliaments, they do ask uh, at, uh, about that. So if it's asked, then it is, if it's requested, it's given, but it's not a public issue. But uh, the tax administration sent the information to the uh, Minister of Finance that uh, the exemptions which has been granted is, has been to this magnitude. Yeah. And similar to, similar to SARS and uh, TRA, uh, tax expenditures and incentives are tracked and monitored uh, in URA by a dedicated team and uh, we've also we also have quite a number of studies that are ongoing in this area because it's an area that uh, we are trying to rationalize as a country so yeah we believe it's an area for continuous improvement I, I just want to confirm South Africa are you making this a uh, tax expenditure uh, information publicly available Oh, it's At aggregated level, we do make it okay. um, Maybe if, if there was a question about uh, how do we collaboratively make information yes. available. I think it's going to be a challenge in the, in the short term, but I think it's something that we should continue uh, to work on in terms of how do we uh, make sure that this micro data as a tax administration does get um, available. I mean, we are, we are working in, in the era of blockchain. Uh, and cloud, <laughs> and I think it, it, it should be important at the heads of states, uh, AU level, to decide what is the African cloud strategy, for instance, so that we can be able to start sharing information. I mean, if we are going continental free trade uh, arrangements, it becomes very important that we start to also share information. I think in the medium to long term, it's something that, uh, that will be necessary for us as a collective. Uh, to work on, but I don't think in the short term uh, it's something that I foresee happening, but certainly medium to, to long term, it's something that's very crucial for us uh, in the continent uh, and maybe even other developing countries to start to look at from a block point of view. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. I just wanted to add that, you know, I think 
Johnson is right. In terms of a long-term view, it is a more long-term um, process to make data available. Mm -hmm. But I think one of the things that we can start exploring in the short term, while we don't have those structures set up, is you know, better enabling virtual access to some of the data labs. I think one of the biggest constraints currently, you know, even if the data sets are not merged, if you're able to have access to the various databases from where you, you are, um, we should try and leverage that a bit more in the short term, um, just so that, you know, you, you eliminate the costs of traveling between things. There's a lot of, um, uh, you know, new technology developments now where, you know, you can use facial recognition to ensure that the people logging onto systems are the correct people who are supposed to have access to the data. Um, so I think starting to, to, to formalize those processes could go a long way in being able to do comparative studies. Mm -hmm. uh, the question that was asked, uh, sorry, you, you go ahead, uh, um, Tina. I think I'm taking it on from Ayanda on uh, trying to make the data available. Currently, uh, URA and UNUIDA are conducting a feasibility on the same, on how we can make um, the data lab uh, accessible virtually. Of, of course, we have to look at uh, what would be the legal framework, what uh, what kind of infrastructure uh, would be would enable us to do this, the data security concerns and all that. So yes, it's an area that we are exploring uh, so that we can uh, make it available for researchers. Thank you. Uh, how about the question on the, uh, the high net worth individuals? What is the scope of, you know, our revenue authorities, or even the ministries of finance, open to this idea to say we can collaborate on how best can we tax high net worth individuals uh, with independent researchers or research institutions, UNWIDA or others? Um, what are your views? There is a specific area that is, you mentioned that high net worth individuals, it's an area that Africa is also looking at, um, and it's an area with potential revenues. Um, what are the thoughts of uh, your thoughts on collaborating with other institutions to, um, to see how best to tax this area? Um, okay, so I think, I guess Johnston sort of covered it for South Africa, but I'll, I'll add even though it's not my area. Um, I, you know, I, I think extensive research um, is always, you know, something that we're, we're looking at. Um, maybe not even just in terms of how you tax them, but also, it, you know, I think there's been a lot of interest in South Africa um, in, in conjunction. You know, I think a lot of people have raised, okay, but you're looking at a basic um, income grant, let's say, what about a wealth tax? If you're going to focus on this, why not the other? Um, and so I think it's an ongoing discussion and we're continuously looking into research into those areas, trying to think what would it actually look like in South Africa? Is it something that makes sense for us? For something that is that much of a policy shift, um, if you're going to make any any proclamation or decision, you need to be you need it to be evidence based. You need to think through what the potential implications are, exactly how you would capture what systems you need to have mm -hmm. in place to be able to see. Um, very, okay, so some assets people will declare, but some assets you'll have to find ways in which to make people um, declare those. So I think it's a it's a very long process. Um, where we're open to collaboration. The tax policy team within National Treasury is continuously collaborating with various research institutions together with the revenue um, receiver um, to, in this area. Yeah, yeah. that's it. Thank you very much. I, Joseph, I want to hear from Tanzania. I'm, I'm not too sure I haven't much collaboration with the outside world with other institutions on research. What are your views? Is the Tanzania open to have other institutions work with you to, on some taxing areas? Yeah, in Tanzania also we work with UNWIDA okay. on, on, on an issue of data. Okay. Though I haven't mentioned, but we have a collaboration with UNWIDA. Okay. There also, and our, our university institution there back home, we work together in, in terms of data. And the other institution is statistic, national statistics. Uh, so we collaborate together also in making, in making that. So yes. uh, you know that is there e everywhere. <laughs> All right. Yeah. Good. Um, I think we have time for one or two more questions. Do we have any? Yeah. Right here. Uh, yes, uh, thank you to all panelists. This has been uh, very insightful. I'm Jukka Pirtila, University of Helsinki and UNU Wider. 
Um, I just wanted to continue on the on, along the lines of, I mean, um, I mean uh, institutional collaborations within the countries, and, and how do you see, in particular, the role of the statistical uh, institutes or the uh, statistical services uh, in, uh, in making data available for researchers going forward? Because I understand that the, tax, that the revenue authorities are, of course, the custodians of the tax administrative data, but in a sense, I mean, uh, it would be logical going forward that there would be a role for the uh, uh, statistical offices as well. So m maybe if you have comments on, on this and whether your country's rules and regulations allow you to share data with the, uh, with the, with the statistical offices. Thank you. Thank you very much. Did you also want to ask a question? Um, okay. Thanks. Uh, I'm Ina Ibrahim from UNUIDA. So you cast all my question, but uh, I tried to change it a little bit. Um, we've spoken a little bit about, we've well, spoken a little bit about international collaborations. What is the scope for collaborations with universities and academics and research institutions within your country? Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's really nice that UNUIDA can come and work with the institutions, but I guess as a South African, I mean, I'm sure I've heard of others, researchers or universities complain and say, actually, well, we, don't, we never get access. Um, you know, is there, is there room uh, and is there space given or priority given for local academics? Okay. Thank you. I think behind this, you also wanted to ask a question? Yes. Yeah. And then... <laughs> um, I was almost um, let, letting go. Mine is not a com uh, question. It's a comment on the high net worth individual. Mm -hmm. Um, sometimes we talk about high net worth individual, but who are these persons? So in Uganda, what we've done is first develop a criteria um, to suit what you call a high net worth individual. Then following that criteria, run through using data analytics and identify who these persons are, then create a specialized office to, to handle this, to focus on them. We are also in, um, um, in plans of exchanging the automatic exchange of information, so we're adding um, the exchanged information, further beefing up our criteria, and then uh, having um, within our large taxpayer a, a, a section that really focuses on this. That is our approach on handling high net worth individual. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that insight. Um, yeah, the, 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 there are two questions really. A scope of collaboration, the role of the National Statistics Office. Do you see any role in this? Uh, are we, should we start pushing the tax administration data to the National Statistics Office? What are your views? Uh, to making this tax data more available to people. And the scope of collaboration with local universities. Yes, we are collaborating with other institutions maybe outside our country, but, uh, but locally, are we collaborating? Um, so maybe I'll, I'll jump in first. Uh, in South Africa, I guess, we, we've started a new uh, project which um, is done together with uh, the Statsase, that's our statistical department, um, with SARS as well and National Treasury and um, another program that we have that's called the City Support Program um, through special, spatial data um, uh, developments and trying to, you know, geocode uh, our tax data. That's an ongoing project as well. Um, we've reached out to StatsSA and we are, they're developing what we're calling an integrated business register, which will, which will put together the different surveys and censuses that the stats department runs um, together with the tax data and a lot of the other data sets that I was sort of alluding to saying we'd like to incorporate um, more data from, you know, the unemployment insurance fund, credit, credit registry data, just so that you have a comprehensive integrated uh, register, um, which probably would be housed at StatsSA, um, but because we already have data lab facilities, um, we would like to still maintain having a version of the data that we can also retain um, for researchers to use. So we definitely do have collaborations and discussions that are ongoing in that space. In terms of um, uh, 
co for example, collaboration with academic researchers. I think the collaborations that you know I was mentioning included a, um, academic um, research as well. So, for example, a lot of us uh, within the National Treasury, if I'd say, would usually partner with an academic, a local academic, or an international academic. Um, but I think for some of the other research papers, we noticed that there's a gap because you know when you collaborate in that manner, you tend to choose from the same source of people that you are that are in your network. So to try and broaden the scope and to also um, include previously disadvantaged um, universities that are not like your top four universities, let's say in South Africa, we're trying to, to experiment with having calls that you know, just look for co-authors so that you know, prospective PhD students can collaborate with some of the international researchers that we have through the SA type program. And that way we also have collaboration with different types of, of researchers and academics. We also have other projects that we collaborate on sometimes with, um, with uh, research institutions. For example, um, some universities, we will have a contract with them in exploring developing the procurement data, for example, which is not necessarily a partnership that's done purely for research, but we do have partner with them to help us set up other databases as well. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. And one, one minute. Yeah. Yeah. So I think I think what's important to note is that uh, in our context, various pieces of legislation give certain responsibility to different uh, ministers in terms of certain data sets. So trade data, for instance, uh, trade statistics, is in the purview of the Revenue Administration Commissioner by law. Um, and other data would belong somewhere else, but there is a provision in the National Statistics Office, as you call it, uh, to call for any data for statistical purposes. So that uh, then allows the Statistics Office to come in uh, and make certain requests uh, to be provided, either of the Central Bank or of the Revenue Authority. Uh, but again, the volumes of data would just be too huge uh, to, be, to be housed there. But I think the portal that has just been launched on special data is an attempt to get into this integrated register that pulls everything together. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, you yeah. have burning, yeah, you can. Sorry, for the case one. of Uganda, yes. we have an MOU mm -hmm. with the statistics office and we routinely share data with them at aggregate level, at micro level. But it's more the micro level data is for more of creating or developing the macro indicators. So um, we haven't got to this stage of making the data available for them so that they can share it uh, with uh, other parties. But it would be interesting um, for us to explore uh, this option. Then regarding collaboration with universities and the, uh, the research institutions, we have to a limited extent, but yeah, uh, it's something that we're also working on. Uh, initially, we've been having the CIT panel data, but we, we are building on more um, data sets. So with this, we plan to create uh, more awareness and uh, collaborations with them. Thank you. Thank you very much for all that. And I think the short answer is the role of the National Statistics Office. They still have a role, but a little bit, uh, not much. Uh, I think the data that you find with them, uh, for the time being, it will be on the, at the aggregate. Uh, but if we still want to use this micro data, taxpayer, individual taxpayer, you know, data that maybe we can track how they've been progressing, things like that, we still have to go through the MOU route and, you know, uh, have that. I think that's quite the short answer that I'm getting, uh, that, uh, yes, at the aggregate level, the National Statistics Office will have some data, but at the micro level data, we still have to go through the, the, the revenue. Authority. Collaboration with the local authorities. South Africa is usually the, the odd one out in Africa because usually they would say, yes, we have that. But for the other countries, we're quite limited on how we are collaborating with the, 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 the local universities and things like that. It's quite limited. And I'm speaking uh, about my own experience uh, about Malawi. So it's not, you might be doing it uh, in Tanzania. But in Malawi, we haven't. Uh, we haven't collaborated to do a research with the university or things like that. That is not really happening. And um, I think for most countries, maybe it's speaking now. But we have collaborated with outside institutions before. They would come say, 
let's work together on this one. So I think it's uh, an important issue to raise uh, because the, sometimes we have the capacity right in the country that we are not utilizing. So thank you very much for raising that. And um, uh, I think at that point is where we ending this session. Um, allow me to thank sincerely uh, Johnson, uh, uh, Tina, Josepha, and Dianda, you know, for uh, sharing your experiences uh, in using tax data to make impactful tax policy. So thank you very much.